Last one on elliptical photography for now. Let's actually put things together. How do we normally implement um, elliptic curve cryptography in practice? So we have seen three different curve shapes. We have seen Edwards and Twisted Edwards curves. We have seen general Weierstrass curves and short Weierstrass curves. And we've seen Montgomery curves. And for each of those, I showed you how the computations work. But if you actually were to implement those on a computer, then, well, okay, you're looking at a large P and you're seeing all these fractions running around. So either the slopes, lambda, lambda had denominators, or in the Edwards formula, we actually went through proving that those denominators are never zero in the good cases, in the complete cases, um, we see divisions. Now, divisions are a lot more expensive than multiplications. In particular, when you're concerned about side channel attacks, one of the typical ways of doing uh, divisions is by first computing an inversion, computing one over the number, and you're doing this, this Fermat's little theorem, and that one is taking, well, the integer to the p minus 2 in order to invert it. Now, computing to p minus 2 com takes log p squarings and something on that scale many multiplications, so it's a rather expensive operation. So what we normally want to do is we want to not compute any divisions. Ideally, not at all, or if we have to, we want to delay them as much as possible. And so we use what is called projective coordinates. Now, if you're a mathematician actually doing a course in algebraic geometry, you will actually learn about projective coordinates as a very mathematical tool. Um, and you talk about homogeneous uh, curve equations and so on. We're using projective coordinates here just as a hands-on tool, as something to avoid divisions, or rather delay divisions, but it's exactly the same coordinates. So we're using representation, um, and now I'm using uppercase coordinates, and if this uppercase coordinate z is non-zero, then I represent my normal point, this x comma y, which is called an affine point, um, as x divided by z and y divided by z. So my normal point, lowercase x, y, turns into a point x, y, z. Well, if I'm going this way, I normally don't have them as fractions, so then z would just be 1. This, uh, this representation is not unique. That's also why I'm not using commas between the coordinates, but I'm using colons. Because if I multiply each of these three coordinates by some non-zero lambda, then I'm getting the same value if I move back to, uh, to these fractions. So actually the point x, y, z is the same as the point lambda x, lambda y, lambda z. So it's a non-unique representation. Now we're going to look at our elliptic curve formulas where we do encounter denominators at least after the first step, and we're going to look at those as fractions. And so we're just going to accept that, okay, our x and our y are on some denominator, well, we have to bring that on the same denominator, so the z has to be the same for x and y, so we might need some cross multiplication depending on the formulas. Um, but then we just compute with those the way that you compute with fractions. So symbolically, we're keeping the numerator and the denominator, we compute formulas for that, and then at the very end of the computation, we're using this map from projective to affine to get the output as the two coordinates that we expected. Okay, so we're getting these formulas by just plugging in x divided by z, y divided by z, and then we bring everything on the same denominator, z3. That's a, a bit of a careful thing because I mean, at the, at the first step, you would have that z is 1, but for every further step, your z is not 1. So you really need to have them also at the beginning. And okay, well, if you're expecting to add x and y, well, now you have to first bring on the same denominator. That's cool if they're from the same point, but if they come from two different points, they have two different denominators, so you have to cross multiply with each other's denominator. On the next slide, I'll show you what comes out when you're doing this for the Edwards curve addition form. 
sometimes for arguing about it uh, you also like to use these because if you well now we come to the algebraic geometry view uh, of projective coordinates you can actually capture infinity like this um, there's still a caveat that most times your formulas are not written that you can reasonably handle this point only for some operations does it work but not for all so this is still not a really valid point you still have a lot of case distinction even if you now can represent infinity so infinity is one of the points that we don't have before and so it's not a point where z is non-zero but it is a point where z is zero so what you're taking then is well you take your normal Weierstrass equation you're replacing x and y by capital x divided by z and capital y divided by z multiply everything to get rid of the denominators and then ask yourself hey what would happen if z is zero and then you find that you're actually getting a point well this u one zero and well you would notice it's not necessarily one here but any lambda gives you the same point so it's the equivalence class of points which has zero lambda zero and okay we choose the zero one zero as a representative so that is actually where this point infinity comes from on the edwards curve I've been talking about multiple points of infinity that we have something in the x direction that we have something in the y direction and so for the Edwards curves also for the arithmetic if you remember we're heading the 1 plus dx1 x2 y1 y2 and we had the 1 minus dx1 and so on so we don't necessarily land on the same denominator for Weierstrass the lambdas come in with different powers of well the x coordinate gets lambda squared, the y coordinate gets lambda cubed. So you're getting different denominators. For the Edwards curves, it's more extreme because, well, we're getting different numbers there. So it sometimes makes sense to have separate denominators. So we're using z as the denominator of x and t as the denominator of y. And then you have this point with, well, two parts of projective coordinates x colon z, y colon t. Again, this you can just work with this as a computational trick and sometimes well for doubling this is great because well you're going to encounter the same values but if you're adding two of those points you would have too many cases where you have to bring things on the same denominator so then it makes more sense to have a unique denominator instead of two separate ones but we can use this um, representation here to motivate the points at infinity on an edwards curve or twist edwards curve Namely, when we do the same thing, so we're replacing our x and y by these fractions, then we multiply everything to get rid of fractions. So we multiply by what you're going to see is a, there's a z square in the x and there's a, y, a t square in the y squared. So we multiply by z squared t squared and then we look at what happens if one of them ends up being zero. We should also say that whenever you have in projective coordinates there's a rule that not all of them must be zero so up here the point zero 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 is forbidden down here none of the components must be zero zero so if i'm looking at z being zero then x must be non-zero and if i'm looking at t being zero then that's yeah t being zero then y must be non-zero okay the rest well plug it in yourself and see that when you have those points, I mean, when you put those things to zero and one, that then the rest comes out so that these ratios hold. And when you're doing that, remember that you have this freedom to multiply by lambda. So this would be the same point as uh, square root of a divided by d colon one, because you could just divide by that number. And both a and d are non-zero, so you can actually divide by them. So this is what the points look like if they exist. And this also gives you the criterion. So the second point exists if and only if d is a square. And this one, well, by dividing out by it, exists if the fraction of d divided by a is a square. And well, that need not be the case. So for the complete Edwards case, where a is a square and d is a non-square, none of these points exist 
which is also a motivation or a justification that the group law is complete because, well, no points are missing. The only points are missing are overextension fields. Once you, go, once you go to a product extension, then those points exist, and then you would have exceptions. But for your crypto case, where you're just staying over FP, you don't have any exceptions unless these rules exist. So as promised, here are some predictive coordinates for adverse curves. So if you go through this procedure, you are plugging in x divided by z, y divided by z for each of the points, you compute the addition law, and you put in a good hour of work. Now it's not quite an hour, but it's it's some work to optimize your formulas, to try to identify common sub-expressions, to um, remove multiplication in favor of additions, like on the first exercise sheet, then you can come up with something where you're seeing, well, if you count carefully the number of dots here, the number of multiplications, then you're going to see 10 multiplications, one squaring, and then a special multiplication, which is this one here, it's a multiplication by lowercase d. I'm highlighting this as a separate counter. You could also just say it's 11 multiplications. But as a designer of a curve, you can actually choose what d you want. Not completely freely. I mean, you must encounter a safe curve. Um, and we're going to see what this actually means in the next three lectures. So this is the last one for now on elliptic curve cryptography. Afterwards, we're going to do some generic attacks, which depend less on elliptic curves, but they also give us criteria for what we want to see in elliptic curve cryptography, so what it means to be a good curve. Um, under those conditions, you still have a lot of flexibility, and so you can typically choose your d to be small. Most importantly, if you're doing, say, large integer arithmetic, you can choose your d to fit into the word size of your computer. It fits into 32 bits even, uh, so even if you have a small old computer, it fits in there. Sometimes it fits into 16 bits. And so this multiplication is a lot cheaper than the other multiplications. Sometimes it's so cheap that it just counts as an addition. Say if your constant would be 2, this would just be double this, so it would be just fine field addition. And sometimes it's a cheaper kind of multiplication. So the real cost are the 10m plus 1s. And of those, um, a little bit can go away if this is something where your input point, like this p is your intermediate point r from the double and always add formula, and the p is your input point, then you can also choose that the input point has z2 equals 1, which would remove, well, one multiplication there. It's a small savings, but it would count. If you're interested in seeing more of this type of formulas, or if you ever are in need of having the best formulas for the best curve shape, um, then Bernstein and I set up the Explicit Formulas Database, EFD, where you can go and click on the slides, and that takes you to hyperloop.org slash EFD. Um, I'm linking specifically to the case of large characteristics, because that's what we cover here in this course, so large prime fields. And I also made some drawings, so if you like the Edwards Curve starfish, there's actually a whole zoo which also covers Weierstrass curves, and then there are Hessian curves and Jacobi quadrics, which all have their own animals. Um, I promised some more on Montgomery curves, namely we looked at the Montgomery letter in the previous talk on the, in the eighth lecture. This is just a repetition, um, except for I've changed the bottom line here, to saying it's using one doubling and one differential addition. So to remind you, differential addition is an addition of two points where the difference of these two points is known. And we have spent some time in the last talk on proving that the difference between P1 and P2, well, we initialize it as P and at every step, this one will continue to have difference, exactly P. So this addition there is not a, just an addition, it's actually a specific addition, namely a differential addition. And Montgomery curves are particularly nice for differential addition. Edwards curves are also nice for differential addition, but Edwards curves, you know, Edwards curves are nice anyway. Montgomery curves, if you want to use them, you typically only want to use them in this Montgomery letter. 
So differential addition on one gun matrix. So assume we have run for some time. So we have computed n times the point and m times the point. Now in our case, these are always going to be a difference one, but the following formulas are the general case where we know the difference. So, well, assume that we know the difference m minus n times p. So the difference of this point minus that point. So we know all of those in all coordinates. And these are points on this elliptic curve. So there's a coefficient a running around. There's also a coefficient b running around, and we will not need b. That's another interesting feature, because um, we'll be skipping completely any computation involving the v-coordinate. So our computation will only involve u and z. So in projective coordinates, it's u and z. In affine coordinates, it will be u divided by z, so just the u-coordinate. That also means that you cannot distinguish a point from its negative. We're only using the u-coordinate of the point. We're not giving anything for the v-coordinate of the point. So we're identifying it. And so you don't know whether you're getting p or minus p. But when you're computing a scalar multiple, or we always want to compute a times p, it doesn't actually matter for the u-coordinate whether you're putting in p or minus p, because a times this point will again have the same u-coordinate, whether it's minus a times p or plus a times p. They will also, well, they are each other's negative, so they share the u-coordinate. And so by skipping all computations involving v, our computations are a lot cheaper than full additions, okay, full additions and doublings, and we also don't need to involve v at all. So here, blamo are the formulas. I don't expect you to see why they work, but I expect you to follow with me to see how expensive they are. So the first one is the differential addition. The second one is doubling. Now for doubling, it's less of a surprise that you don't know the v-coordinate. For addition, well, remember that you normally take the difference of the points, and so your, your ratio, or the slope, is the difference in the v-coordinates divided by the difference in the u-coordinates. So there normally v plays an important role, but the point that we get from subtracting one point from the other, namely the fixed difference, has the same slope encapsulated. And so instead of having this difference of v coordinates, we're using pieces of this difference points here. So this is here where the coordinates of the difference point come in. So this is the fixed known difference. And then here we have the coordinates of the other two points. So this is of the n times p and of the m times p. Now, when we look at how many operations we actually need, then we see one multiplication here, one multiplication there, a squaring. But then there's another multiplication here. But if you look, this is actually the same as in the previous line, also here. So the addition part. Well, has one multiplication here, one multiplication there, another multiplication here times the z m minus n, a multiplication times the u m minus n. So this is four multiplication and two squarings. The contents of these two squarings are not the same, so we have to do both. Then for doublings, well, you might recognize this trick from the uh, first exercise sheet, from the doubling exercise, that if you want to compute. 2 times AB, you can use the second binomial formula. Here it's a bit more complicated. I need 4 times UN, and so I'm using the first binomial formula and the second binomial formula. Well, this gives us something with plus 2 UNZN, this gives us something with minus 2 UNZN, and then a minus sign between. Okay, so adding those two subtracts all the square parts, so they fall away, and we're left with 4 UNZN. So that takes us, instead of one multiplication, it takes us two squarings. That doesn't sound like a good deal until you realize, oh, it's the same squarings I would need to compute here anyway. So these two squarings are the same as over here. So if I pay for them here, they came for free there. So I'm paying 
two squares here, one more application. I now have computed this whole chunk. I still need to pay for this multiplication here. All that squaring I have already. That piece I have computed already. So I have another multiplication with this constant. Okay, so it was um, four multiplications, two squarings up here. Now let's count again. There's one, two, three multiplications and one, two squarings in the doublings. And so that is giving us the operation count for the differential addition and doubling. Um, now in the letter where we have that we're looking at fixed difference m minus n b1, um, then we would like to choose the input point to be affine so that the z coordinate is 1. And also, like I said, for the Edwards clues, we like to choose our coefficients so that the multiplications by constants are very cheap. So we're choosing this to be small, this, sorry, the zn to be 1. And so we don't have to pay for this multiplication. So then it goes down to five multiplications and four squarings. And we might also want to choose our base point to be small. Um, here's actually a famous example of a Montgomery curve, namely curve 2519, which was proposed by Bernstein in 2006 and is now actually a standard for the internet. So if you want to get everything, how to implement it, what it's defined as, go to the RFC 7748. RFC stands for Request for Comments, which sounds like, well, they still want your opinion. They actually don't. This is a fixed curve. Here are the prime, that's also why it's called 25519. So it's 2 to the 255 minus 19. You can check this is a prime. And then the A coefficient is this. Now, remember on the previous slide, I was multiplying by A plus 2 over 4. And A plus 2 over 4 is this number, which is the smallest that satisfies all the properties that, well, we put on a page called safecurves.cr.yp.to because that's the properties for safe curves. So smallest means, well, you couldn't do better in that multiplication. So finally, this curve is birational equivalent to an Edwards curve that looks like this. And ah, this looks very familiar. This is exactly the same number as this a plus 2 or 4 up here. So that's nice already. Um, but you might also be puzzled a little bit because if you actually, after watching this video, sit down and go like, hey, I learned how to compute birational equivalences in the sixth video. Let me take this as an example. You would not actually get to this shape. You would be getting to a twisted Edwards curve where a is not one. Remember, a is the coefficient in front of here. And so let me briefly walk through what would happen there. So the map in that part six would get you to something I'm now using prime, like these dashes, in order to denote that these are different a's and d's and x and y's. And what you would be getting, well, the a was the a minus two divided, uh, a minus two divided by four, uh, by b, sorry, this is a minus two, b is one. And the d prime here is the a plus two, so that's this value divided by b, b is one. And so both of those are rather big coefficients. But you can notice that this a prime happens to be a square. And then if a prime is a square, say b, um, then we can do a coordinate transformation here. So if we now have instead of a prime b prime squared, we would have a b squared a prime squared. We can introduce a new coordinate which I call x, which is b x prime. And so then we have the square of this coordinate here in the first position. I'm actually not going to do anything about the y. So the new y is just going to be the old y. Okay, so I've now renamed this thing to just being y squared because I'm just including this b, well, the a's prime part, which is the same as b squared, in this a's and this x squared. Um, but then, oh, what do I do about this x prime squared here? I'm now sort of missing this a prime because, I mean, I need a a prime, I need a b squared in order to go to my new coordinate. And so what effectively happens 
is that I'm getting a prime divided by d prime as a new d. So if this coefficient here is a square, you can always bring it over on the other side, make this monic, put the one there, and get a, this one divided by that one. So getting d prime divided by a prime as your new, new d. And now we're almost there. So now looking at my a prime and my d prime, and then notice that both of these numbers are divisible by 4. And that's actually what has happened. So the number here is the d prime, taking this one divided by 4, and this one is the a prime divided by 4. So I've just eliminated a 4 in numerator, 4 in denominator, and that is the shortest form I have over fp. I could now um, compute some number, but when you compute this fraction, it is actually a longer number. So keeping these as the ratio makes the cheapest form this. So we have now seen one sort of famous or typical um, Montgomery curve, which you can find on the internet. So if you actually see x25519, x25519, uh, when you check what your browser is using, that is using this elliptic curve in the Diffie-Hellman key x change. That's where the x comes from. So that is exactly the curve which, when I showed you in the introduction, was appearing in my TLS configuration. We now know all the pieces. We now know how to do computations on this curve. And we can now also link this up to our Edwards curve shapes because we now have a matching curve in Edwards form corresponding to curve to 519. Okay, that's the end of the part on the optic curves. We now get into a text. We will come back to more stuff that is specific to elliptic curves, but this is really the part how you do um, basic elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman.